Thank you very much, Stephanie. I appreciate that. And uh, for those of y'all who have seen me up here before, usually I have something to say because with a lot of the books we publish, I feel like I actually know a little bit of something of what's going on. I'm not going to make any claims about this one because uh, this is a project of uh, many, many years of effort uh, by both authors. And today we're, good, we're lucky enough to have David Dockery here. Uh, and David knows a lot of things that I don't know. And so I'm going to get out of the way. Uh, I just want to say that we're delighted to publish the book. Uh, we did this with the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, it was a fantastic partnership. And uh, the result, if you compare this, this is what I did. If you compare this to books from other states that are comparable, this is, if not the best, it's certainly one of the best of this kind of large reference work for a single state. So I'm, we're delighted to have worked with David over the past few years. And uh, we're also happy to have our friends from Lemuria here. As Stephanie said, uh, they are selling books, uh, and you can get those signed afterwards. So, David, please come on up and tell us all about it. Actually, we've worked with Craig for, I don't know, it seemed like 10 years almost, because we had a start of this book. And uh, Craig told us, well, it'll cost $20,000 to edit and for the book design and layout, and then it'll cost $100,000 to publish. Well, you know, that was a little pricey for us. But, you know, publishing costs have come down. And we finally got to the point where we could do this. And uh, now, we have a bulletin series, so we've been publishing books since 1854, in a sense. Now, one of them's coming up. But, uh, with our situation, we would get a, a printer on a contract, lowest bid, and hope they did a good job. And so it was, we did all the work. Working with University Press is like laying your troubles on their doorstep. <laughs> and that has been a wonderful thing. They had a really good copy, editor Lisa, to, uh, in fact, she had to change, we were in a science format she had to change the whole format of half a million words to publisher. And when she started sending this stuff back in publisher, that was my first, you know, heart attack moment. I got with Craig, what is, she, what is this? And uh, so anyway, we, I realized, okay, it's a different format. And then, uh, so we were in tune with it from then on. And then it goes to the book designer, and we have scientific words in this book. Uh, lots of them. They're all in italics. And somewhere along the line, the book designer, now, the, by the way, I have no complaint about the book designer. He did a beautiful job with this book, I think. You know, from selection of font and everything else, uh, I have nothing but highest praise for him. But I will say this, uh, he did drop our italics. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you have to go back and find each individual word to put the italics back. You know, once once somebody drops the italics. So anyway, we've got all that worked out. So it's, it's um, anyway, we're real thrilled to have worked with them. And um, so um, the title there, The Geology of Mississippi, there's a drill bit. That drill bit was a discovery bit for the Tinsley Field, our first oil field and the biggest oil field in the state of Mississippi. Let me see. I got my little clicker. Okay, where's my help? Push it that way. Okay, I need on-site help to get this thing clear. I'm pushing this button. Yes, no slash. Okay, can I get you to click on it? I mean, or is it unless there's something else? All right, I'm going to nod my head and he's going to, I'm going to have a personal clicker. Okay, we'll try it again. Here we go. There we go. All right, we're on now. Bye. Uh, our organization, the Mississippi Geological Survey, was founded in 1850. Uh, it was associated with the brand new University of Mississippi, and planners were the ones who wanted a geological survey because they recognized that soil is just weather bedrock, and geology should have a lot to do with planners. 
Now, James Kelly, the, uh, who's a history consultant for the Free State of Jones, I don't guess he's here. He keeps telling me he's going to show up, and I'll never see him. But, uh, you know, we work with him on that because the western side of the state has some of the better soil, and poor Jones County was left out. And that had something to do with the development of the society of Jones County as compared to other places. But, so, that's how we got our start. And, and... In 1930, around 1939, our agency, the Mississippi Geological Survey, got a WPA grant to do the geology of 10 counties. In 1939, in the midst of the Great Depression, a war is coming on, and we get $106,000 to study uh, 10 counties. Now, we had to give, provide 10% of that, so the legislature only gave us like 4000 and we had to gin it up from the other 10 counties, 6,000. Well, 6,000 for those 10 counties to give in a depression, that was a lot. But the second county we studied was Yazoo County. And uh, doing the geologic map of Yazoo County, we discovered a domal structure that had potential for oil and gas. And a year after we gave a press release, uh, the first well was drilled and it was a gusher. And uh, Tinsley Field today has produced 200 million barrels of oil. And it started the oil boom in Mississippi. And by 1970, and 70 was the peak oil production for the country. Uh, at 1970, we were uh, seventh among the oil producing states. And during my career with the office, uh, about every year, the state gets uh, $100 million just in severance fees for oil and gas production. So, uh, and by the way, Steve Yates gave me a wonderful book review Sunday. I want y'all to give him a, a big hand. And one of the things, I told him, one of the things I liked about that review was he noticed in the pictures in this book of geologists doing their job that we we're all so happy and having a great time. And that is the truth. We are so happy and having a great time. This is... A surface map, Tinsley Field is up at the upper left, the Jackson Dome is at the lower right, and in the 1930s uh, they drilled that dome and found gas, and some say it helped us get out of the Great Depression, the, uh, the value of the gas found at Jackson, and then in 39 in Tinsley uh, is when they drilled in the Tinsley Dome, and uh, I'm trying to press the record. <laughs> The Tinsley Dome. Now these are the two domes. That's Tinsley Dome on, on the left in that cross section and Jackson Dome on the right. The geologic mapper went there and in the creek, at Perry Creek, the creek cut down into the Moody's Branch Formation, which was about 300 feet high at that point. He realized he had a dome. The fossils in that formation clued the geologic mapper that there was a 300 foot uplift at this point. And also at Jackson, the uh, Pearl River cuts down into the Moody's Branch Formation, showing there's about a 500-foot uplift at Jackson. And uh, this information has created great wealth for the state of Mississippi. Uh, these are some of the reviews of the book. Uh, the first review is by uh, Warren D. Alvin. He's a, a Cornell professor. He was a Harvard graduate and director of the Paleontological Research Institute. Now, I don't want to insult you, but I'm going to read it. It says, this magnificent book will be a fundamental resource for every geologist and paleontologist working or interested in the Gulf Coast. It's beautiful and abundant illustrations combined with exhaustive and authoritative yet very readable, I like that, text <laughs> makes it a landmark in our understanding of the stunning and diverse and important geology of this section of the country. The author's broad and deep experience is evident on every page. They have produced a model of how to write seriously about regional geology for a wide audience that includes lay people uh, in the early 21st century. It's a remarkable achievement. Well, that was very nice of Warren to give us that review. And he sent me an email after he got his book from uh, University Press. You endorse that book, and University Press sends you a copy, so he got his copy, and then he told me, he says, it's better than what I said. <laughs> so, so that was good. I mean, remember, I'm selling books here for Lemuria. <laughs> you get it? Uh, the next one is from Jerry uh, Nash, our political commentator that you all know. Jerry's not here, is he? Okay. 
Well, I'll go on with this. Uh, Jerry's also worked with us for historical purposes to see how geology and histor history make together. If you want to know why Mississippi is built the way it is, then look no further. For those looking ahead to what I predict will be the next major political battle or battles, how we use and conserve our underground water, the geology of Mississippi explains in great detail where the aquifers are located, how they got there, and what may become of them. The geology of Mississippi is a great one-stop shop for anything you may want to know about our state's environmental history. Uh, I appreciate Jerry's comment. I thought he might get me fired because water is a very important topic around here. But uh, they cut a sentence or two to help me out a bit in, uh, in that review. And I, one of the questions they asked me when I came in, what about our water tables? And um, we're going to get to that. But first, this is BLCO Wells. It's a miniature portrait done by John J. Audubon and comes in a little locket. And, but you can blow it up, still looks really good. And so uh, he did the first geology of Mississippi in 1854. Uh, and that is, he was out there collecting, kind of like Robert Seifert, who's from Natchez, goes out and picks up these Lake Superior agates, the glaciers dosed them out of Lake Superior and the rivers brought them down to Natchez. But uh, we have one Lake Superior agate in that neck uh, bracelet. But anyway, those are some cut stones that uh, B.O. Wells had cut. Now, this is what the book looks like in signatures. Uh, the good thing about this type of publishing is the pages don't come all apart. It's uh, printed in signatures. Each signature has 16 pages. There are 48 signatures in the book. This is the stratigraphy. You know, in geology, we have stratigraphy. <laughs> this is the stratigraphy of the book. The introduction, uh, a chapter on physiology, ecoregions, and surface geology, and then from the oldest rock to the youngest rock, we deal with all the rocks in the state of Mississippi. Another view, now no, let me back up. See how they have staggered uh, the little marks on the pages so that if any uh, signature gets out of whack, you can see it before you bind it. So that was interesting to me. And then each signature has the signature number and the pages that it contains. Uh, now, these, one thing I said to geologists, you can always, don't just get one, get two, because you can use them for bookends. They're big enough to stand on their own. And in between these bookends are our previous geologies of the Mississippi we published. At the left is by BLC Wells, the Agriculture Geology in Mississippi. And on the far right is the most recent done in 18, 1925. So this is you know, almost 100 years and on a new book that's fairly substantial. Now, you know, Alabama has great geology, Louisiana has great geology, Tennessee has great geology, and Missouri has great geology too, would you say? Mm -hmm. I don't have the one from Missouri, but let's do this. All right, there's our bookends, our new book on Mississippi. Uh, to, on the left side, there's the geology of Alabama. It's out of print, but you know, if you can find one, there it is. Uh, that's the geology of Tennessee, that's the geology of Louisiana to the geology of Florida. And uh, I, I'm just saying, if, if Governor Bryant, who did a forward for this book, uh, wants to hand out a few books to his governor friends, they will not be able to reciprocate. <laughs> uh, so Craig, that, uh, we may have them all be around here. Okay, groundwater. Then the introduction, we cover groundwater and topic we have certain topics we covered. Now, that's me and Wilbur Bowman, and the point here is, when I was a freshman at Mississippi State, I went in in 68. In the summer of 69, I worked for the Mississippi Geological Survey as what we call a sunbeam, summer hill. And so I was working for them in the summer, and my first job was Rankin County Geology. And there we have a Rankin County Geology book with a Rankin County Geology map. Wilbur Bowman was doing that work, and I was his driller's helper. But I had one year of college, and so we kind of knew what was going on together. But he was my mentor, and so that's the experience I bring to this book starting about 69, and then other counties and other counties, and then quadrangle maps. So we've covered the state pretty much. This is the map of where your aquifers are. 
what the aquifers are that you would use if you uh, drill at a certain location. And the contours you show, you see there, the base of fresh water. And basically, if you move over a certain area, uh, the aquifer that was, had fresh water here may have salt water as you go down south, let's say. So you have to move up an aquifer and catch the one that still has fresh water. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so as Jerry Nash says, we show you where the aquifers are. This is uh, Baptist drilling the well. They did that in, uh, in 2010, you know, when we had a cold winter and the, all the pipes in Jackson broke and we were out water, without water and then DEQ had uh, portable johns outside the building because we had no water pressure. And so uh, Baptist said, you know, we're gonna get our own system. So they're drilling a well here. They're going down to the Sparta Aquifer, it's 800 feet. That's the pump test, that's Bill Oakley. Water is beautiful, perfectly clear. The pH on that water is 8.7. The health department wants 8.4 to make sure you don't corrode the pipes. Uh, Flint, Michigan, their water that was going through their pipes was 7.4, not 8.4. The water in our building is 6.3 right now for Jackson. And so uh, I'll make that point to show that the value of a good source of groundwater. That water, you could bottle it, and Jackson is flushing their toilet. I mean, Baptist Hospital is flushing their toilets with better water than anybody else in Jackson has. Uh, now, water levels, this is um, the Mississippi River Alluvial Aquifer. It's uh, the most heavily pumped aquifer in the state, and it produces a multi-billion dollar agriculture and aquaculture uh, industry in the state of Mississippi. Those contours, are on the top of the water table. We call it the physiometric surface, the top of the water table. There's a little hole in the middle there where they're really pumping for the catfish ponds and for rice or, or whatever. And that's an oblique view of it. That, now that's in 1980. I'm going to show you what lo that looked like in 2008. See how that hole's gotten bigger and deeper over there? So that's in the book and uh, so People now in the Delta are trying to take measures to conserve the water so it doesn't do like some of the, like the high plain aquifer where you just drink it down to the last drop. Earthquakes, we have earthquakes uh, that have earthquake centers in Mississippi. Now, unfortunately, the Madison earthquakes we had last year are not on this particular map, though they are in the book. We got them, in, those earthquakes in the map in the book. But if you look over here in Clark County, there are a bunch of little earthquakes there, very similar to the ones that happened at Madison. A lot of them are faults on salt structures. And uh, this is a seismogram of an earthquake that occurred right here in 19, uh, March 25, 1996. But the amazing thing about this is Katie Underwood was in the ninth grade, and this was her uh, science fair project to put her uh, a seismograph together herself and set it up to a computer and she was the only local person to pick up that seismogram of that particular earthquake. Physiography, ecoregion, surface geology, uh, higher high places. This is Mount Woodall in Tishomingo County. You can see the peak back there, 108, uh, 806 feet high. This is Mount Lebanon in Union County. Uh, 790 feet high. Uh, the reason those mountains are there is if you have a sandy formation and the rain falls, the sand soaks it up, okay? And sand will hold a higher angle of repose than clay, which will slump if it gets a steep cut. So our sandy units and rocky units make what we call quasas, ridges that go across the outcrop belt along the state. Uh, so uh, this is the McNary sand holding up that particular peak. And then this is a Tallahatta formation. We'll look at it a little bit later. That holds up Mount Barton. That's the city of Meridian. That's a pretty good little vista from the uh, top of Mount Barton. And then we have our prairies. Uh, in fact, when you look at the weather map, uh, you'll see a couple of features. You'll see the Mississippi River alluvial plain, what we call the delta. That stands out on the weather map. And then you see this Archie Way belt that goes 
from Tennessee down through Mississippi and into Alabama, that's the black prairie. And that's what the prairie looks like. It's there because there's Cretaceous chalk that weathers to a black soil and uh, makes prairie lands, flat lands, like you see here. You see the cattle grazing in the background. Okay, now for geology. We saw some geology earlier, but this is a map that I tell people realtor, realtors should never look at. <laughs> this is a map of Clinton, and it works like this. Uh, this is a boundary up here. You see my little pointer? From here, going along here to there, on the east side of the city, this is all Yazley Clay. On the west side, this is formations that will be a whole lot better foundation. So uh, if you're selling your home and you're on the Yazley Clay, you don't want this map to go public. If you're buying a home, this can save you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, either if you're going to build, if you're going to build on the clay, you better build for it. Um, so uh, that's the value of a geologic map other than oil and gas and minerals and stuff like that. These maps have an environmental value. Now if you're going to do a landfill, the clay makes a good seal for that. If you're going to do a sanitary landfill. So you certainly don't want to put the landfill and the stuff on the other side of this map where it can get into an aquifer. Okay, structural geology in Mississippi's Precambrian Paleozoic basement rocks. This is a structural geology map of Mississippi. Uh, right down here, we have the Appalachian Mountains in Mississippi, they just buried under other stuff. So the Appalachian Mountains plunge underneath the coastal plain. And then we have right here the Wachita Mountains coming through. And if you could remove all the layers on top of them, you'd have the roots of these mountains. Now what you're going to see next is a cross section from A to A prime from Tennessee to Horn Island out here. And that's, this is the Tennessee line, this is Horn Island. This basin right here is called the Black Warrior Basin. It's full of very old rock called Paleozoic rock. Rock is 550 million years to uh, about 250 million years old. And uh, there are a lot of coal seams down in this stuff. And then here are the buried Appalachian Mountains, right there, with thrust faults and fold belts. And then on the other side of that is a, a younger basin. This is a Jurassic Age basin right here, Jurassic, last in Jurassic Park, time of the dinosaurs. But for us, it was a time when North America and actually Africa occupied that spot. Africa occupied this spot right in here. Africa pulled away from us forming the Atlantic as we know it today and the Gulf as we know it today. But that young Gulf was surrounded, was landlocked, and the uh, seawater that came in deposited like three to 6,000 feet of salt. And we call this the Mississippi Interior Salt Basin. Uh, the salt does like this. It's lighter than the stuff on top of it. It's kind of like it's doing this and then you get a dome come up. And this dome right here is uh, Richardson Dome, and that's where the, at one time they were trying to deposit all our nation's nuclear waste. Mm -hmm. And our argument was, no, it's still moving, you can't do that. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, anyway, the nuclear waste is not there. I say we won the argument. My boss here, who was in the middle of it, says, don't give us credit for that. But I think they should get some credit. Uh, this is the Washita belt. You can see the fold belts here. Uh, and associated with Washita Mountains, they're just buried under younger sediments. Now this is the oldest rock in the state. It's the Ross uh, limestone, or in this case it's the Ross chert. This is Devonian, it's uh, about 400 million years old, and it has the fossils we know as trilobites. Uh, there's the tail of a trilobite right there, and all these brachypod shells. Uh, here you have the little trilobites when they molt, you know, the the plate that's the head comes off, we call that the cephalon, the thorax will break up in lots of little plate, then the tail of the thing is one plate is, is preserved. These have molted and this head is right side up, this head is looking at you, see the multifaceted eye? This head is upside down, so there are three little trilobite heads there. Uh, it's another trilobite head from that site. Now this would have been the whole thing, unfortunately in the surf on the island, they, they get abraded. 
But if it were whole, it would look like this. This is one from Tennessee. This is a genus called Huntonia, and that's in the Smithsonian. It's about a foot long. So that's a pretty good fossil. And if you're on Tishomingo, if you're in Tishomingo County on Pickwick Lake, this is Cooper Hollow. Uh, the waterfalls are over the Fort Payne Church. You can see the little uh, boat there is coming, spent the night, you know, people sleeping on that boat while we come motoring in uh, and our John boat to disturb them. This is what it looks like in the fall. You can see the full length of the falls there. But the Fort Payne Church, uh, this is a quarry. I believe it or not, this is in Mississippi. This would remind you of someplace in Missouri, perhaps. But there's a person standing right there. This is in the book. He has a 25-foot stadium that comes up about that high. So this wall is over 100 feet high. And the top of the wall is Tuscumbia limestone. The bottom is Fort Payne Church. And it's a black layer right here of church. You can see it right there. There's a black layer of church that separates the two formations. The drought water is coming through this and then spilling out on the surface over that church layer. Now, the Indians, and we have uh, archaeologists here, love the Fort Payne Church. It shows up everywhere in what we call Arrowhead collections. Uh, here's a little sample of Arrowheads that James Torrance had. Those are three points right there we can identify as Fort Payne Church. Uh, this is Devotage just right across the line in Alabama where they were pouring the church just across the line from Mississippi and uh, we're going to look at this point here up close. It kind of shows you the both sides and the structure there. So this is kind of forensic geology. This is where geology informs archaeology. Uh, where did they get this? We can help you. We'll get into more of that in this talk. Uh, this is another picture of that quarry. This is Iuka Quarry in Tishomingo County. This is the Tuscumbia limestone, but here is a paleo cave in the limestone. And look at all the debris coming out of the cave here at the bottom, and there's a truck for scale to see how big this is. Uh, the top of that limestone, you can see the cross beds. We're used to cross bedding in sands, quartz sands, but in the Bahamas, there's no quartz sand. You have little sand-sized particles of calcium carbonate, and they act as a sand. So this is like the Bahamas is today. You have these uh, shallow water dunes that are getting cross bedded, but the uh, particles are all carbonate grains. Now, this is engineering geology, but it's also in Tishomingo County. In Tishomingo State Park, Haynes Lake, uh, people don't always ask us about where to build lakes, but they're starting to. And we've nixed some sites, by the way, to people's great displeasure. But Haynes Lake is not one they asked us about, but actually we put our drill rig there and tried to fill up the holes. It didn't work. Uh, this is a limestone in, oops, in the Pride Mountain Formation right here. It uh, has a joint pattern which has been, has solution down the joint. So now the limestone blocks are gapped and we call that karst. And look at the spillway for the lake is up here and all these gaps are down here, so they're like 28 springs <laughs> that empty the lake. So it never gets full like it's supposed to be. This is also a Tishomingo County. It's a Hartzell sandstone used as a building stone, but it's like a 300 million year old beach <laughs> sand. Uh, you can see the little uh, layers of, on the rock, and each layer is a different seafloor. You can see the little trails on the seafloor. And then out to sea comes these big logs. Now the logs are not like trees we know today. They're scale trees called lepidodendron. And that has been sitting there a while. This is what it, I'm going to show you what that looked like quarry. There's the quarryman. There's the log when he quarried that back in 1966. You see the pattern on the trunk. It looks like a Chinese checkerboard kind of because the leaves would come right off the trunk and then leave a scar. And that's what you're seeing on that uh, lepidodendron. Another view of that. Okay, uh, Sam Brooks, where are you? Right here. All right, well, stick your hand up. Oh, all right, you're too close. I told him I was going to do this to him. He's an archaeologist. We'll see how good of a geologist he is. I'm going to show you some more pictures of uh, the Hartzell Sandstone. That's the Bay Springs Locking Dam. There's uh, 
some trails down there, and that's George Phillips looking at the little trails. On top, he's looking at uh, those are ripple marks from, you know, like you see on the beach when the tide goes out. That's, you can see the ripple marks on that right there. Okay, now we're going to do some forensics. We're going to look at the Clinton Post Office. Okay, there's the Clinton Post Office. Is that Hartzell Sandstone? Now, before you say anything, I'm going to look, give you another choice, a little bit closer. That chimney is built out of Catahoula Sandstone. It's only 30 million years old. Hartzell Sandstone is 300 million years old. Uh, so that's Catahoula Sandstone. The old Capitol building was built out of Catahoula Sandstone. Uh, and actually the quarryman was high, was using the best stone for gravestones for his side job and sent the capital the worst rock and eventually it had to come down because it got what we call pyrite disease it had pyrite in it and it let you know sulfuric acid out and the, the stone got soft so but anyway this is good stone because it's been around since 1830 Catahoula sandstone that's the quarry at Raymond, Mississippi, where they quarried the rock for the old capital and for all these gravestones. Uh, and we can tell the Catahoula sandstone because it has a milky opaline cement that looks like that. See the sand grains and that, that milky cement? All right, so what do you think uh, for the Clinton Post Office? Is it Catahoula sandstone or is it um, Hartzell sandstone. Say something, you gotta say something. Catahoula. Catahoula. It says Catahoula sandstone. We're gonna do forensics and zoom into the rock and find out, okay? You ready for this? And when you can, when anybody in the audience, other than the guys who already know that work with us, when you recognize which one it is, will you please raise your hand? There's the wall. Keep looking. Is there anything in there that'll give this away from one or the other? Look again. Okay, Barb, tell me. Stand up and tell me. What do you see? I see the tree trunk scale. A lepidodendron tree trunk in the thing. Just like the Hartzell. So forensic geology, that's Hartzell sandstone, or at least something the same age as Hartzell sandstone. So uh, that's a close-up uh, picture of it. And there again you can see the lepidodendron and, and uh, the Hartzell. Okay, chapter three, uh, Jurassic and Jura Triassic and Jurassic paleontology. Uh, during the Jurassic, the uh, Mississippi embayment had a sort of a rift and uh, the uh, New Madrid Fault Zone is still part of that, by the way. But along that, we had a lot of volcanic activity and we have a granite mountain buried right up under the uh, Tallahatchie, Yalabusha, and Grenada counties. And Marathon drilled a well like a mile deep into that granite thinking they were going to come out with something good on the other side. <laughs> they did some great science, but it was a terrible mistake for them as far as economics. These are some of the granite cores. Uh, they, we call these sidewall cores, and they're not very big, but they, if you're studying igneous petrology, they go from granite, which is silica rich, all the way to gabbro, which is silica poor, you got every kind of granite you can imagine in that mountain. Uh, also, from the interior salt basin, we have salt domes. This is Tatum Salt Dome, where they had a nuclear blast. That little hole right there is the size of the nuclear blast, and it's kind of enlarged to show you the radioactive melt in the bottom of that little hole. And there's the cross section that you're seeing there. And there's the salt core showing what the Jurassic salt looks like. Uh, that underlies uh, southern Mississippi from the Tatum Dome. Cretaceous geology. Obviously, I'm going through big chapters really quick. Uh, we're all interested in the uh, volcano under Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, it was actually came up from the seafloor. It pushed strata up ahead of it, making an island. And the island has a footprint that you see here. It's kind of a heart-shaped footprint because there's a little vent under the col or there's a big vent under the Coliseum and another one on the line between Jackson and Clinton, Mississippi. Denberry Resources has done seismic of that. I know it's got to be beautiful. They will not show it to us, but we have seen some seismic in where the uh, Madison earthquakes happened. And so uh, 
we kind of know what's going on about those earthquakes. Uh, but we can't tell a lot of that either. We have a confidential, confidentiality agreement. This cross section you're about to look goes from uh, Pickens, Mississippi to Terry, Mississippi, right through this volcanic island. And there it is. Here's Pickens up here. Here's Terry here. There's a well at Terry, an Exxon well, that goes down four and a half miles. That's four miles right there. Uh, so we have wells that give us information. Then we have seismic information to connect the points between wells. There's a vent that comes within a half a mile of the surface of Jackson. The age of a lot of these rocks is 75 million years old. When that's when the biggest uplift happened. But there's some older volcanic rocks in this mix. Uh, CO2 from gases of this ancient uh, volcano charged this yellow formation called the Northlet Sand with so much CO2 that we have in the counties of Rankin County and Madison County, we have 10% of the National Reserve of CO2. And did various using that CO2 to pipe it to oil, oil fields and get what's left of the oil. And what's left of the oil can be substantial. Uh, so uh, this right here is Luxat Field. It's on a salt structure uh, and they drill down in there and as I understand it, under that pressure, CO2 is a liquid. And uh, so they have caboodles of it. And Denbury is so, this thing is so important to Denbury that they on their 2007 annual report has kind of got an artist to do a picture of what Jackson looked like as a ball. Uh, volcanic island and here's the little dinosaurs down here. Here's a little pterosaur flying over and uh, they had several others but I couldn't throw them all in. And then here's the a magnetic anomaly for the uh, Jackson Dome and but here are other volcanic structures. Uh, we call this the Sharky Platform right here. It's a series of volcanic structures in the middle of the Mississippi embayment. Uh, the, the ferric minerals and the uh, uh, igneous rocks under Jackson throw off the magnetic field. And that's what's going on here, 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 and here. Now this is a gravity map. Uh, there's a gravity anomaly over uh, the Jackson Dome and over Midnight Volcano in uh, Humphreys County. And recently they had a, a PRN had this thing about going back in time and, and decided, well you can't go back in time but you can go into the future because the satellites time goes faster for them than it does people on the ground closer to the center of gravity. Because gravity slows time. So if you want to go in the future, go out there and then come back. You made a trip into the future. All right, well look, it's, I, nobody's seen the show, I guess, so. Uh, <laughs> you can do the same thing by going from Jackson to Pelahatchee. You know, time's a little slower at Jackson and Pelahatchee, so you don't have to go into outer space. Just travel in your car to Pila Hatch and come back and you've time traveled, okay? Uh, this shows you some of the igneous rock. This is phonolite. Uh, this is uh, one of the volcanic structures that's under the delta. This is uh, smack over limestone. You can see this used to be flat, but when this igneous flow came underground, it peeled back the layers. Can you see it there? And you can see a little uh, mixing of these layers with the phonolite. And there's flow structure in there as well. Phonolite is the chemistry of the rock that uh, came out of Vesuvius and covered Pompeii and Herculeum under 80 feet of molten ash. So what's under Jackson was something like that, if you please. Uh, now, these, another good thing about the Cretaceous. This is my wife, Mary, right here. And she is right over there with her sister, Ida, uh, collecting seashells from uh, the coffee sand, the Cretaceous formation. Everywhere else, you, the Cretaceous is so old, you know, 65 million years to 135 million years, and the shells are like casts and moles, or either replaced by calcite or something like that. We are the state, along with part of Tennessee, where our preservation is so good, you get the actual shell. Uh, this is a, a shell called Terra Sorella Maria, named after my wife. Uh, in great detail. Now that's an artist's drawing of it. Uh, here's an ammonite uh, with mother of pearl uh, luster on the shell. Uh, now this is one of the creatures of the Cretaceous found in Mississippi. This is called Thoracosaurus. It's kind of like a garble uh, 
crock, if you please, with that long, narrow snout. Another view of it. Uh, these are shells with the color pattern still on them from the Cretaceous. Can you see those color patterns? And this is recent from the Caribbean. You see the same color pattern. Now, I was asked to edit a paper for the Journal of Geology from some French colleagues that had used ultraviolet light to uncover the color patterns of the Cretaceous shells. And they were so proud of their technique. They had one of these from France, and they said, it is a solid orange. And all I did was send the editor, oops, send the editor this picture and say, no, it's not. We have one with the original color pattern preserved, and it looks just like the modern shell. Well, they lost that, their paper to get published. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what could they say? Because I sent them the picture, too, you know. Uh, you, we don't have to use ultraviolet light to figure out what our color patterns are. They're on the shells. Uh, this is a, a very large a volute. Uh, gastropod and I uh, just show you some of the preservation with a little uh, digitate lip that it has. Uh, Paleocene geology. Uh, one interesting thing is the dinosaurs we believe were killed out, killed off by an asteroid impact at Yucatan, which must have caused lots of damage in our area, including maybe tsunamis and unconformities. The chalk is the Cretaceous part, and then the Formations above are the Clayton Formation, the earliest of, of the post Cretaceous, at the time when there are no more dinosaurs. Uh, this is a, a Turtilla limestone from our Clayton in Mississippi. Now that's me when I was at Ole Miss in graduate school. But this is a sand unit that was one time a beach. And it's called uh, the Cold Bluff member of the Nahiola Formation. But some of these sands from groundwater have been turned into quartzite, and they're very substantial. And uh, this is my colleague and co-author, David Thompson. Beach sands today, if you go off to Horn Island, there are commercial deposits of heavy minerals, titanium oxide, or rutile, and other things, but you can't, can't you mine those sands because uh, they're a na national reserve, the beaches are. Well, we have ancient beaches that are now uplifted in the form of, of the Nahiola Formation, and you can see the heavy minerals in that hole right there. That, uh, and then here's a pan. We'll show you how to pan for heavy minerals. Uh, that's the quartz sand, which is a common sand. This is the rutile and ilmenite right here, and zircon. Zirconium is used to clad the uh, nuclear fuel in nuclear reactors. And so that's what we use zirconium for. It has a very high melting temperature and works real well for that purpose. Um, then in our uh, Paleocene, we've got the Red Hills lignite mine. We have a lot of lignite deposits. And this shows the different seams that they're mining. And here's a four foot seam right here that was currently mined. There's another four foot seam below that they're mining now. That's one of the haul trucks. Uh, to show you how big this is. And the thing about this mine is that gas prices can go up and down, oil prices can go up and down. If you're making electric power with oil or gas, you don't know the future. They know the future for the next 40 years with this mine. It's going to cost the same. Now, what do you do? Let's say there's, see that big old crane down in the hole there? And we saw a picture of it, just, just that big old thing. Uh, it has an extension cord back to the power plant. It runs on electricity produced by the power plant. The extension cord is about that big around, has 68,000 volts. So the generated power is kind of like a perpetual motion machine. Generated power digs the mine and produces power to go back to the generation site. Plus, you have enough electricity to sell to everybody else. Uh, Early Eocene geology. Uh, we're, we have a lot of things I'm showing you have world significance, global significance, and they're from Mississippi. And we have people from all over the globe come here for that reason. And they'll be in somebody's backyard, and they don't, people who have the property don't have any idea of the value globally of what's in their own backyard. This is at Meridian near the super, uh, the Walmart that's now there. Uh, this is Chris Beard from the uh, 
uh, Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, and he has won at this time that he's there the MacArthur Genius Award, which is a $500 gift for what $500,000 gift for whatever you want to use it for. So uh, he is digging here for for fossil mammal teeth mixed with shark teeth in this particular formation. This little sand right here is very thin, it's full of shark teeth, it's full of fish teeth and other things. And uh, it's got 22 different species of mammals identified from the teeth alone. These teeth are from the second earliest primate known. It's called Telhardina magnoliana, uh, named for the magnolia state. The earliest one is what he won the MacArthur Genius Award for. He found that in China. So, this is what the little creature looked like, a little lemur looking creature. And this is the journey it took. The first one was in China, then it comes along coastal zones around to Mississippi, and then it migrated to Wyoming, and then they have a specimen in Belgium. Well, the geologists in Belgium don't like this at all. Chris is the expert, but they don't like this. They wanted to come from China to Belgium, so they are the second oldest primate. And they have sent students here to check us. I mean, they have gone to ex uh, extensive measures to hold their standing as having a second oldest primate. But right now, it's us. This is the Bashar Formation, a little bit higher up in the section. It's also early Eocene. But this is another primate, a little bit bigger than the one that we identified below. So we have a, a, the beginning of the primate history here in, in Mississippi. Uh, also from the Bashi, this vertebra right here, that is a, a python. This is of a huge sea snake. This vertebra right here is from Jackson, another huge sea snake. So, um, you know, back in the Paleocene, the snakes were getting pretty big. Middle Eocene. Chapter 7. Uh, we think of Middle Eocene, uh, this map comes to mind. It's an old highway map from 1968 when they were cutting through uh, a cuesta of the Tallahatta Formation. And they used, uh, it looks like you're in Wyoming almost. Here's a little plant growing out of the cliffside right here in the white rock. Uh, Tallahatta is an Indian word for white rock. It's come from Tallahatta Hills in Alabama. And that Rock makes a question from Alabama all the way to Grenada uh, with stone looking pretty much like this. Uh, this stone was formed at a time of global warmth and in which silica was precipitating in the seafloors worldwide and we have an example of that period of time preserved here. This is at Meridian. You can see this when you're driving toward Meridian on I-20, you see a big excavated ridge. And this is what you're looking at up close. Within this uh, Tallahatta formation, you have a layer of quartzite, sedimentary quartzite that the Indians used for napping points. We're going to look at it a little closer. See that? It's just a, a layer of quartzite. It makes a very good point. Plus, it's, since it's not gravel, you can get a really big point out of it. Those are some points from Tallahatta quartzite. From the, they were from Moundville and North. Uh, Alabama, so these things travel. When you can make a good point like that from a Mississippi port site, those things travel and are traded. Uh, so that's in the Smithsonian collection. These are some that we've collected. Uh, this is, these are all napped by, you know, flint nappers. But uh, it can, Tallahatta port site can be black. Uh, it's typically like this, a sugary color, or it can be brown. But the whole thing is, in forensic geology, we can tell you that, yeah, that's Tallahatta. Uh, this Tallahatta piece has a little shark tooth in it. Can you see it? Uh, now this is Kosciuszko quartzite, a different type of quartzite, but also identifiable. Now, th this was in a marine environment, but you know, logs would come out and get petrified in that marine environment. This is Tallahatta quartzite with <laughs> petrified wood, and you can see the annual rings. Well, since this was a time of global warmth, it wasn't cold and warm that's making these rings. It was dry season and rainy season making the rings you see in that rock. Now, what would an Indian think if he was nipping, uh, napping his uh, Tallahatta quartzite and had a piece of petrified wood? That's where it is. See the petrified wood, Tallahatta quartzite? Uh, 
some Indian got the fancy for a two-tone point. <laughs> and uh, it seemed like it would naturally break there, no telling how many points he napped before he got one that didn't break. There's the other view of it. Uh, okay, Lake Eocene. Uh, that's the Yazoo Clay. We're here in the Jackson area. Uh, this is the Moody's Branch Formation on Town Creek. Uh, Charles Lyell in 1840 went to this site and collected stuff. B.L.C. Wells, in, uh, in his book published in 1854, has four plates of fossil shells from this site. Uh, this is a fossil whale. In fact, that's a state fossil. We used to call it Ziggy for Zagariza, but we now know it's an older species called Dorodon. It's a 16 foot long fossil whale from the Moody's Branch Formation near the Tinsley Oil Field. Now that's my wife Mary. She didn't know I was going to throw this one in because I didn't do it yesterday when I gave this thing. Uh, she is in France at Le Capelle, which is near Paris. This is a sand pit full of shells the same age as we have in Jackson. And they don't, they're all the same age. They look like our stuff too. And uh, that's taken with a 135 millimeter lens, uh, it's Kodachrome film. And you see the Scottish thistle? I, I took it where they are in focus and here the background's blurred. But here's the Scottish thistle in France and Mary. And see that little bag? It's full of shells. And uh, those shells, these are clevolithes from France. These are clevolithes from Moody's Branch here in Jackson, Mississippi. And that's an extinct genus, by the way. So. Oh, I just threw this in, and her sister's here too. This is in the book. <laughs> this is Ida. She is pointing out the bathtub ring for the 2009 Mississippi River, Mississippi River flood on the flood wall at Vicksburg. And the floods do leave their bathtub rings. So uh, you can see how high the flood came. And then you can match it to previous floods of previous years uh, as marked on the flood wall. All right, now we're back to shells at Jackson. This is a cone shell from the Town Creek locality, beautifully preserved, but also the chemistry of the shell is preserved. And so if you do drill for oxygen isotopes, and oxygen isotopes vary depending on the temperature of the seawater. Uh, so this spire of the shell where you get the full growth has been drilled, all these little pits, for different oxygen isotopes. Okay, here's a drill hole that comes up with a seawater temperature of 25.7 degrees centigrade. Now, you got to think centigrade, not Fahrenheit. That's not cold water, that's warm water. Uh, here's another one, 21.6 degrees centigrade. Well, that's the winter temperature. So, here's the winter temperature down here, and here's a, well, anyway, I can't go into the zone to see exactly where those come out, but here's a curve. This is summer, winter, summer, winter, summer. Shell was eight years old, but we also know the seawater, how cold did it get in the winter? How hot did it get in the summer? Well, we know that it didn't get as cold in the winter as it does now, so it was tropical, and which explains the cone shells, which are tropical shells, plus a cone shell that bites you is poisonous, by the way. Uh, this is a basilosaur from, uh, from the Yazoo clay of the Lady Eocene, then the Oligocene. Uh, this is Michael Bograd, my boss at a quarry at Redwood. Uh, that's Michael Bograd and uh, Jim uh, Coleman at the same quarry. Uh, now this is a collaboration with archaeologists and geologists. There are a lot of limestone effigy pipes. You know, they have a bowl for tobacco and a bowl, uh, a hole for the reed. And uh, the med uh, medicine men would make these elaborate pipes, you know, kind of like uh, to show their status. And so we assembled some at the, at the archives over there across from uh, the Old Capitol Museum. And we had collections from several places. And in 1996, I was able to identify 10 of these as Glendon limestone. And then uh, Vin Stefanotti said, how did you do that? Well, this is how I did it. See that little fossil right there? That is a foraminifera one-celled animal that gets really big, in this case, Lepidocyclonus supra, which is a Glendon limestone marker fossil. And here's a little creek, little uh, effigy pipe uh, that that fossil, you can see it on the side of that effigy pipe. Uh, this is a limestone, Glendon limestone on the Mississippi River, so the Indians had a rel uh, 
really easy source of it in Vicksburg. And this is where those pipes have shown up in various places from Alabama all the way to uh, Oklahoma. And here are 12 of, of the Glendon Limestone effigy pipes. And it's sort of a style called the Bel Air style. Uh, in Smithsonian, we've been to Harvard Smithsonian, and this is Smithsonian collection uh, with a little clamshell from the Vicksburg group, and that's a little panther. We'll see it next. There it is, that little wafer. That's the forearm right there. That's the, a marker fossil for the Glendon. Uh, here it shows a little air showing it in the publication, showing what the little uh, lepidocycline looked like in cross section. Uh, then we did uh, went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, to the Gilchrist um, Gilchrist collection. And actually, I met uh, Craig Gill in the airport when I was headed that way, and he was headed to New Jersey. And it'd been so long since I worked with him on the book, I looked at him and thought. I know him. <laughs> and I go up and I said, you work for Mary's? He says, I'm Craig Gill. I go, oh. <laughs> but uh, that's where we were headed, and uh, that's the museum. And here we are looking at these pipes. Here's one that actually came from Washington County, Mississippi, and it's part of that collection. Can you see how elaborate that is? And it had this raptor has a little human head it's grabbed, and that little human head right here on the eye has a lepidocyclone right there, Glendon, bang. And it doesn't take any time to figure it out either. That's what's so cool about it. It's not like we have to work hard to do it. I'm almost through. This is chapter 10, the Neogene. I'm leaving out a whole lot, obviously. But uh, this is the Raymond Cemetery. See the Scottish box grave? Uh, that's Catahoula sandstone that should have gone to the Capitol building, but instead went to somebody's box grave, OK? Uh, this is another very elaborate thing. and. The interesting thing is, I'm saying they use the good stone for this. I want to show you the inscription. Absalom H. Alston uh, died 1838, age eight years, one month, nine days. You know the parents that counted every day for that child. There are three other childs that have the same thing, children, the same marker, which this monument honors. And of course, yellow fever was going up and down the river at this time, so there was a huge demand to honor children and spouses and everything else, and that's why the Stone quarry had such a good side business. Uh, so that's at the Raymond Cemetery. That's easy to get to. Well, this is Antioch Baptist Church. You have to go to Hazelhurst and then go west, and then you don't know where you are. But there's this cemetery. There's a cemetery. There's another Scottish box grave out of Catahoula Sandstone. And uh, if you look at the date there, death date was 1838, about the same time they were quarrying that stone. So I don't know how many, for you archaeologists, Sam, Perk up, find me those box graves. I want to know every cemetery that's got one of these Scottish box graves with Catahoula sandstone, because I know they got to be a lot more out there. Uh, and then that's how we can identify it, that milky uh, mix. Here's the other uh, example of the milky opal cement. Now, a milky opal cement, and this opal cement is precious opal with opalescence. And we have, that's our only gemstone in Mississippi. James Starnes is right here, is responsible for discovering it in Claiborne County. We don't tell where it's from, not many people know. Uh, this is a rock, you can see the opalescence. See the opalescence here? And here's a cut stone with opalescence. And uh, so that's our sole gemstone for the state of Mississippi. Now, they're Indian effigy pipes made out of this sandstone. In fact, you can get the sandstone and the limestone almost in the same outcrop, the sandstone being on higher up the <coughs> section. Uh, this is Nan now who do I have here? This is Nancy Ro Rossoff at the Brooklyn Museum. And Annabelle uh, Rodriguez. Uh, that's Nancy. <laughs> She's kind of posing like the little space here. See that? <laughs> So we're looking at this to see if it's got a little sandstone. There's the staff. There's several things we're looking at to check. Okay, I'm, this is the closing part. This is the fun part for me. There's, this is Lurs. This is windblown glacial dust from dust storms in the Ice Age when the Mississippi River was a braided stream and there was not vegetated. And the wet season, it was full of water. In the dry season, it was full of dust. And that dust would be caught by a northerly or a westerly and piled up. 
on the west side of uh, the um, valley wall, on the east side of the valley wall. Wind blowing to the west, east side of the valley wall. In, this, in Vicksburg, that's up to 100 feet thick of lurs, okay? But it cuts a vertical wall. And people cut that vertical wall. Uh, here's an example of what you can do with a vertical wall. <laughs> Carve your initials. This was done uh, 78 by Hind students that lived in Vicksburg and were going to Raymond. And when Dwayne Allman died, they said, we want to do something for him. Uh, Rolling Stone said he was the greatest, second greatest guitarist of all time. And they carved that, and it lasted there for about 10 years. It's called what I call Lurse Arch. Uh, here's another view of it. You can see 2378 on the right side. There they are carving it. I got it from one of the, this picture from one of the carvers. And uh, so they're carving it. They're in the process of, and see, it's already been carved, but they're doing deeper letters to carve through the other little names on the wall. And here's one to Pink Floyd. <laughs> see it up there? They got up there, and there are bricks in that, by the way. Like you're another brick in the wall, there are bricks, uh, Pink Floyd, and then they sprayed it pink. And that's where I stopped. 